All right, welcome back again, everybody. Today we're going to be doing section 12.5, which is where we learn all about lines and planes. Um, lines and planes. So we'll go ahead and get started. Let me pull up the slides here. All right, so one thing I want to point out is this, just to give you a little bit of fair warning, this section is quite a, quite a long section. Um, so you might notice that there's, a, there's 49 slides here. Uh, there's just a ton of content in this section because you got to talk all about lines and then all about planes and then a quick bit about distances and then I'll, I'll teach you some helpful Mathematica commands. So you may want to break this one into two parts, maybe splitting it right about here. Um, just because there's a bunch of different forms of lines and a few forms of planes. So it does take a little bit of time. So you may want to settle in, uh, grab some snacks. You may want to pause in the middle, but let's go forward here. Right. So here is the motivating idea. If you've got a line in the XY plane, if you remember that it's entirely determined by a point on the line and a direction of travel, which we call the slope. So in R2, let me draw a quick little sketch here. In R2, you basically have a point somewhere and then you've got a direction and that completely determines a line, right? So what we wanna do is we wanna extend this idea to lines in three-dimensional space and beyond. So you can have a line, I mean, this, this right here, this pencil is kinda of like a line in space, right? So the question is how do we determine exactly how to describe this line right here in space? And the idea is about the same. We need a point on the line, first of all, maybe we need this point right here, and then we need a direction. We need to know where that line is going, and it could be pointing in all these ways. So how do we determine direction in space? Well, we use vectors, right? So <laughs> we, already, oops, we already established a way of describing points in space with the Cartesian coordinate system, and we found a way of describing direction in space in the form of a vector. So that's exactly like what well, that's exactly what we're going to do here. So if we want to describe a line in three space, we just need a point and a vector saying where the line is going. So here's the setup. Let's let p sub zero be some fixed point on the line L. You can use this uh, this figure for comparison. This is the line L that we want to describe, right? Um, here is the point p naught. This is just a, a fixed point on the line. And then pick any other arbitrary point on the line you want, the point P of X, Y, Z. Now, we're going to let R naught be the position vector of that fixed point. And then we can write the, the vector in this form, X naught, Y naught, Z naught. So that is the position vector given right here. Then we're going to let R be the position vector of that arbitrary point that we picked right here. So this is the vector R and it leads us to that uh, arbitrary point that we picked, right? Now, if this vector here, A, is the vector that goes from P naught to P, then what we can do <laughs> is we can add these two vectors together. We can take the vector R naught and then add it, or add the vector A to it, and that will take us to this vector R right here, right? So R naught, a is the same as R, using that vector arithmetic that we saw back in section 12.2. Uh, so that's kind of the idea. Now, let V be any vector parallel to the line L. We just need a vector that is parallel to the line. We don't necessarily need this particular vector. We just need a direction, right? So this vector will work just fine. Now, one thing we know is that this vector here, since it's parallel to the vector V, they have to be scalar multiples of each other. So that means there must exist some scalar, we'll call it t, such that a is equal to t times v. They're parallel. So there's this vector here, and if we scale it a little bit, we get this vector. And so now we can write a as this vector t times v. Right. From that, we get the vector equation of a line. So this is the vector equation of a line. It says if you want to get any point on that line, or if you want any, if you want to get any uh, position vector of a point on that line, then you start by going here, and then you move along this vector t units. That's the idea. So that's kind of how it's described. Um, 
let's go through the structure a little bit and try to make some intuitive sense of what's going on here. Uh, t is what we call the parameter, and it's a scalar. Uh, each value of t gives you the position vector of some point on the line L. So for example, if t is 0, then this term completely disappears, and you're at this point on the line right here. Uh, if t is a positive number, then you're going to be over here somewhere. And if t is negative, you're going to be down here somewhere. And what's nice about this is take a notice of how similar this is to the slope-intercept form of a line in R2. Everyone's favorite, right? <laughs> so here, the way that I like to describe this when I'm teaching this in like algebra or pre-calculus is this form of a line in R2 basically says start here and then go this far in this direction. And that's what this is saying too. It's basically saying start here and then go this far in this direction. And that's how you describe a line in space. So this is the vector equation of a line in space. And again, this actually works for any space. So notice here, even though we were using three-dimensional space, this idea does generalize to any dimensions. So it doesn't have to be two dimensions or three dimensions, or, and it could be any number of dimensions that you want. Right. Um, yeah, so as t varies, the line L gets traced out by the terminal point of this vector r. So as t changes, the end, the, the, the position vector <laughs> of R T tells you where the line is and it'll just follow along like so. Uh, like you can see in the picture here, positive values of T correspond to points on the line that lie on one side of the initial point or the given point. Negative values of T correspond to going the other direction or the, the opposite of that vector that gives us the, uh, the slope of the line, the direction of the line. And that's how it works. And again, if T is zero, you're right at that original fixed point that you're given. Okay, now from this, we can also describe the vector in terms of its components. And this can be helpful because sometimes you wanna really see what's going on component-wise. So take note that the vector TV can be written as T times A, T times B, T times C. So if we're starting with this vector form of a line, we can break everything up into components and look at it uh, component-wise. So r of t is just x of t, y of t, z of t, basically saying where to go in each coordinate direction. And r r naught is equal to this. This is the position vector for r naught. And then tv is equal to this. Now you can do algebraic vector arithmetic, and you can express this vector in terms of its components. x naught plus t a y naught plus tb, z naught plus tc. One second here. There we go. Okay. And now from that, we get the parametric equations for a line. So the parametric equations for a line are basically the component equations that you get. So if you've got a line that contains the point x naught, y naught, z naught, and it's parallel to the vector abc, then the parametric equations are just the component equations, uh, the, or yeah, the component equations that you get. X behavior is given by this. Y behavior is given by this. Z behavior is given by this. And that's it. Uh, another important thing, these numbers here, A, B, and C, those are called the direction numbers of L. And that makes sense if you think about it, right? They're called the direction numbers because they're basically telling you which direction to move and how far along the different coordinate axes. That's really what it is. So they're, they're, they're direction numbers. Um, also, notice that when we have a line, each one of the components is linear, which makes sense, right? <laughs> if we want to describe a line, it makes sense that our components are all given by linear functions. Right? These are linear functions. These actually are mx plus b, literally. Here's mx plus b for the first component. Here's mx plus b for the second component. Here's mx plus c for the third component. And all three of those are linear, so that means that the result has to be a line in space. Right. Okay, so now I want you to try this one. Uh, find a vector equation and find parametric equations for the line that passes through this point and is parallel to this vector, and then find two other points on the line. So first I wanna throw the thinker up. Just think about how you would proceed to begin with. 
right? Now say something out loud. Remember, you can say it to your dog, your cat, your pet, your sister, your brother, your parents, whoever. You could say it to yourself. You could say it to your hand. Just say something out loud. Give your brain that feedback. Okay, now try it on your own. So find the vector equation, find the parametric equations, and then find two points on the line, two, set, two other points on the line. Okay, all right, now let's work on it together. So the good news is the vector equation should be pretty quick. I mean, we have a point and we have a, a vector telling us the direction of the line. So we can just put this together using the position vector for this point and then this will be our direction vector for the line. So right off the bat, we get this. There it is. So R of T is this plus T times this. Basic algebraic vector arithmetic, we can combine all these into a single vector. And then here I'm expressing it in terms of the standard basis vectors, just to kind of, uh, just to kind of emphasize certain attributes here. Okay, Ooh, hold on one second. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. So here are the, the coefficients of those standard basis vectors. Uh, so that's the vector equation. Now that we've got the vector equation, we can easily peel off the parametric equations. Um, we just take those coefficients of the basis vectors, and those are our parametric equations. Boom. Now, after that, if we want to find two other points, you can just pick whatever values of t that you want and plug them in and you'll get two extra points. So I did t equals plus or minus one. And oh, remember, you don't wanna plug in t equals zero because that'll just give you the point that you started with, five, one, three. So you gotta pick other values of t. I picked negative one and one. If I plug in negative one, I get five minus one, one minus four, and three plus two. So you get four, negative three, oops, that's a three, <laughs> five, which is what's right there. And do the same thing for positive one, you'll get this. Not too bad, huh? All right, uh, one thing to address. So you might have noticed that we, well, I'll, I'll just say this. You can use any vector that is parallel to the direction vector that determines the line, and you can use any point on the line to describe that line. So what that means is that the vector equations and the parametric equations for a line are not unique. There's infinitely many ways you can describe the line. It just depends on the point you choose and the parallel vector that you choose. Um, it might feel a little bit odd at first to think about it like that, but I like this example. Um, think, just think about, for the fa think about the fact that this line is the same as this line right here. And it's not so weird. All I did was I multiplied this equation by two and I got this equation. So even though these equations are different equations, they describe the same line. They are the same line. So the fact that we can describe that the, the fact that the vector equations and the parametric equations are not unique isn't totally bizarre. Um, yeah, exactly. So choosing different points, a, a different point or a different parallel vector will give you a, a equivalent but different equations. Right, now here's another form of a line. So we have multiple ways of describing a line. We saw the vector equation, we saw the collection of parametric equations, and now we're gonna produce the symmetric equations of a line. So you can take each one of the parametric equations and solve for the parameter t. And when you do that, you get this. Um, right now, we're assuming that none of the direction vectors are zero. Solve for t, all three of those equations, and you get this, this, this. And now you can equate all of these expressions, and you get the symmetric equations for a line. Right. Now we have three different ways of describing a line. The vector equation, the parametric equations, and the symmetric equations. Three different structures there. Um, if it turns out that one of A, B, or C is equal to zero, then you can still construct the equations. You just go back to the original parametric equations. And what happens is you just get something like this instead. So if A is zero, you can't write it, you can't divide by zero here, right? But if A is gonna be zero, then it turns out that this is just gonna be X naught. If you look at the parametric equations, let me go back. 
Um, that was a good, here we go. Yeah, so if A is zero, this term disappears entirely. And then it turns out that X is just the constant X naught. That's what I'm saying. So you can still produce symmetric equations for your line. It's just one of the forms is gonna be constant. That's what this is saying. And what this also means is that the line L has to lie in the vertical plane X equals X naught. So that kind of just like simplifies things in a certain way. All right, now <laughs> to add on top of that, there's also another way of expressing lines. Um, if instead you are given two points on a line, then what you can do is you can rewrite the direction numbers as the, the, the difference between those two points or um, uh, the direction numbers are the difference between the coordinates of those two points. And that's what you get here. So instead of knowing a single point and a slope, quote unquote, if you only know two points, you can still produce this very easily. It's just now your direction numbers are given by these differences. And again, this is a good time to, to use your intuition and, and think back to like two dimensional space and you know lines on the plane. This makes sense, right? Because if you remember having to do those problems from the past where you had to find the equation of a line, if you had two points, the first thing you would do is find the slope, right? <laughs> well, how would you find the slope? You would do the differences, right? You would use the, the, um, uh, the difference quotient and you would find the slope and then the slope would give you your direction numbers in that case. This is the same thing happening here, except we started with just knowing the, the quote unquote slope which I'll just say is the direction. So if you don't know the direction, but you know two points on the line, you can still produce these equations. That's the idea. All right, another example. So I want you to try this one at home as well. So try to find parametric equations and symmetric equations for the line that passes through these two points. That's the first part of the question. Next, at what point does the line intersect the xy plane? So ponder this for a minute, look at it, read it over a couple of times in your head. <clears throat> All right, now just say something out loud to yourself about how you could proceed. Okay, and now try to work it out on your own and we will do it together in just a moment. All right, here we go. So first thing is we would like to have a direction vector. So a vector that's parallel to the line. So let's just take the vector that, the vector that connects these two points, the vector that goes from A to B, the displacement vector from A to B. We compute it using just vector arithmetic, and we get this. So this is a vector that is parallel to the line, one, negative three, seven. Now that we have this vector that says the direction of the line, pick whatever point you want, and you got a vector equation. Boom. I picked the point A. So here's the position vector of A. Now I can use that formula for the vector equation of a line, put it together, and boom, there it is. So <laughs> vector equation, or I should say vector equation, and then actually, yeah, th this is the vector equation. And then you can peel out all of the parametric equations. And then from that, you can get the symmetric equations. There we go. So now we've got the parametric equations. And then remember to find the symmetric equations. You solve each one of these for t, and then you set them all equal to each other. So from this, we get that here. Actually, I'll write this right here. We get that um, t is equal to x minus 2. Here, we're going to get what y minus 1 divided by negative 3. OK, and then here we're going to get z plus 5 divided by 7. Yeah, that's right. And lo and behold, that's what we have down here. Those are the symmetric equations. So not too bad, right? It's not too bad. Uh, Again, this extends to higher dimensions. So if you want to imagine what a line in four dimensional space looks like, you would just have another equation and you'd have another component of your vector equation and you'd have another part of your symmetric equations and it would all just extend nicely. Okay, that was part one of the question. 
The next part of the question was, where does this line intersect the xy plane? Is that right? Yeah, where does it intersect the xy plane? So this one takes a little bit of thinking, but think about it like this. If your line is going to cut through the xy plane, then that means z has to be equal to 0. So let me, let me put up the thinker here, ponder this for just a moment here. Um, let me go back. Oop, let me go back. Let me go back to this. Okay, at what point does the line intersect the xy plane? Okay, if the line crosses the xy plane, that means the z coordinate at that point would be zero because we're literally touching the xy plane. That's where z is equal to zero. So from that, we can use our parametric equations to find that point. Here we go. So since we know that z is equal to 0 at this point, we can use the parametric equation that we had for z to solve for the parameter t. And we get that t is equal to 5 sevenths. So what this means is that when the parameter is 5 sevenths, the point must be on the xy plane. The point of the line must be on the xy plane. Now we just take 5 sevenths, plug it into our other parametric equations, and we can produce the actual point of intersection. So 2 plus 5 sevenths, 1 minus 15 sevenths, and then boom. There it is. So we've got our line. We found where it intersects the xy plane, and we're good to go. OK. All right, so the next thing we need to talk about is line segments in space. And this is an important example because we're basically going to produce the the canonical par parameterization of a line segment. And you'll see this used forevermore. It's just a very nice result. So I want to make sure that you leave with an intuitive understanding of it. Um, like I say right here, oftentimes we don't want to consider like a whole infinite line. We just want a line segment. So let's start with a vector equation of a line. Here we go. And we're going to say r naught is the position vector of a given point on the line and v is a direction vector parallel to the line. And let's also say that L passes through the terminal point of another position vector. So basically, imagine there's another point on the line, and we're going to basically figure out how to describe how to pass from one point to the other. That's what we're going to do. Right. Now, because the terminal point of this other position vector is on the line, that means we can describe our direction vector v as this difference, the difference between r1 and r0. Right. So it's kind of, I don't know if you can kind of see it with my fingers, but it's like, here's, okay, I'll try to do this the right way. Here's r0, the tip of my finger. Here's r1. Wait, here we go. <laughs> Here's R0 at the tip of my finger. Here's R1 at the tip of my finger. And what we can do is we can just find the displacement vector between the terminal points here. And the displacement vector between these two points will be parallel to the direction vector of our line. So that's what I'm doing right here. Right? Now I'm just going to use our original equation for the line and substitute R1 minus R0 for V. So that's what I did right here. Let me uh, emphasize it a bit here. Here's V. There's R1 minus R0. Do a little bit of arithmetic, and you get this result right here. OK, and that, my friends, is the vector equation for a line segment, the line segment that goes from the tip of R0 to the tip of R1, where those are the position vectors of those points. And this is the vector equation that you have right here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right, so this equation is actually very, very natural. And you'll, you'll see it a lot later on. So I just want to talk a little bit about the intuition for it. Look at the structure for a moment. R0 gives you the position of a point on the line. And R1 gives you the position of another point on the line. And these coefficients here, 1 minus t and t, are kind of giving and taking from one another in a certain sense. And what happens is as t, the parameter, passes between 0 and 1, it literally takes you from one point to the other point as t goes from 0 
to one. That's what's happening. So let me let me do this. R of zero is going to give you what? So R of zero is going to give you one minus zero times R zero. I'll write like that plus zero times R one. But look, this term completely disappears. And this term just becomes R zero. So <laughs> when T is equal to zero, you end up with the position vector that gives you the first point, right? Now plug in T equals one. So I'm gonna erase this stuff here. Actually, I'll just erase all this. Okay, now plug in T equals one. And what you get is 1 minus 1 r0 plus 1 times r1. In this case, this term completely wipes out. And what you're left with is r1. There you go. And that's how it works. So in general, what you have is you have this like uh, this uh, this percentage, <laughs> this percentage kind of going on. And this basically tells you how you have these these complementary percentages, right? As you go from zero to one, it's like, uh, like if this were 10%, this would be 90%, right? 10%, 90%, and then vice versa. <laughs> and as your percentage goes from zero to one, you go from one point to the other. And that, that's why you have that structure there. That's the intuition for, for this uh, this formula here, this equation. There we go. Cool stuff, huh? So that's how you parameterize a line segment and go from one point to the other. Right, other types of lines in space. So are there are these other lines that are called skew lines. Now, skew lines are lines that do not intersect and they are not parallel. So they can't be parallel, they can't touch each other. They're skew lines, they're like, you know, skewed, right? So yeah, and as a consequence, that means they can't lie in the same plane. So for this first example, we're going to do this. We're going to show that the lines L1 and L2 right here, given by these parametric equations, are skew lines. And I want you to try this on your own at first. So ponder this for a minute and ask yourself, how could you show that these lines are skew lines? All right, now say something out loud to yourself. If you're not, it, like, how about, try to answer this question out loud. If you're not parallel and you don't intersect, that means you're a skew line. Or those are, that means those lines are skew lines. Right, now try to work it out on your own. Show that these two lines are skew lines by showing that they don't intersect and that they are not parallel and then we'll do it together. All right, here we go. So let me think about this for a minute. So, okay, they, if they're skew lines, that means they don't intersect, and that means they don't, or I mean, that means they're not parallel. So what we really need to show is that they don't intersect and they're not parallel. Well, I think I do, do I do parallelism first? Yeah, I do parallelism first. So remember that for two lines to be parallel, that would mean that the direction vectors have to be parallel. And parallel vectors are parallel if and only if they're scalar multiples of each other, if they're proportional to each other, right? It's kind of like the same direction, but a different size of vector. Um, so just by, by inspection, we can see that these vectors are not proportional to each other. Um, there's no constant that you could multiply each one of these by and get these numbers. You could try it. Like, you know, I could multiply one by a half. I'm sorry, I could multiply one by two. I should say this. I, should, I could multiply one by two and I would get this. But then if I multiply three by two, I would not get one. And you can kind of go through it like that and you'll see um, through exhaustion that they're not proportional to each other. So they are not parallel got that done already. Now, to show that they don't intersect, well, that means we need to show that there is no point where all of those equations are equal to each other at the same point, at the same, yeah, exactly, at the same point. Um, so the only way they could possibly intersect is if the respective component equations were equal for some values of the parameters involved, right? 
So that would mean that the X coordinates are the same, the Y coordinates are the same, and the Z coordinates are the same. So in order for these things to intersect, there must be values of T and S where all of these are true at the same time, at the same time. So we're gonna see if that actually happens. Um, first thing is if you solve the first pair of equations, you can get values for T and S. So we're gonna, we're gonna break this up into some steps. Uh, you could pair off these two equations, solve them by elimination or substitution, whichever you wanna use. Uh, you, you, you could solve this, for, solve this for T and plug it into here and then get a value for S and then so on and so on. Or you could multiply them by something and then add them together. And when you do that, you'll find that T equals 11 fifths and S equals 8 fifths. Right. Now we can take these results and we can plug those into the third equation. And when we do that, we get that this would then be equal to this. Do some arithmetic simplification, and that means that these would have to be equal. And that is definitely not true. That's a contradiction. Nine fifths. <laughs> Nine is not equal to 17. Zero is not equal to one. Um, so therefore, the lines can't intersect either, because if they did, we'd have problems. So that means they're skew lines. They're not parallel, and they don't intersect, so they must be skew lines. All right, uh, <laughs> moving right along. This is where we get into planes. So this is one of those times where uh, you may want to take a little break, pause the video, um, go grab a snack, grab some water, something like that. Uh, and then I'll continue in just a moment here. <clears throat> okay. All right. Okay, I'm going to continue now. Uh, so the first part of this lecture was all about lines. And now the next part is going to be all about planes. So we want to be able to describe a way, I'm sorry, we want to be able to find a way to describe a plane in space. So let's start with what we know about two dimensions and think about lines. Um, I'm sorry, uh, let, let's, well, well, let's think about what we know about lines. So a line in space can be determined by a point and a direction vector. So if I've got a point, right, and I know a direction, I can describe a line. Now, maybe I can leverage that to describe a plane too. Maybe, but the problem is if I just know like a point and a, a, a vector that is say in the plane, that won't completely determine the plane. And one way of imagining that is, um, imagine you were holding the plane on the tip of your finger. Uh, maybe I'll even, here we go. I'll use something like this. Okay, so it's like if I've got a plane in my hand, right? And I balanced it on the tip of my finger. Well, the problem is that this plane could be parallel to the floor or it could be tilted in this direction, that direction. It could be tilted in all these different directions, right? Like so. And in fact, if you only had a vector that was parallel to the plane, so imagine this is a vector and it's in the plane, right? Well, even still, I could tip the plane around that vector. So having a vector that is contained in the plane or parallel to the plane in that sense, well, that's not enough information to uniquely determine a plane. So what we really need is we really need a vector that is going to account for that tipping behavior. And that's what we call a normal vector. In particular, a normal vector is orthogonal to the plane. So this is where there's a certain rigidity involved, right? If my finger is here and I tip my finger with the plane, that's really what, what we need. So we need a vector that's orthogonal to the plane, not a vector that is, uh, that is parallel to the plane or, or in the plane, you could say. Ponder that, ponder that for a minute. Okay. Uh, yes. All right, so here is where we just, oh, no, yeah, here we go. <laughs> Looking too far ahead. Um, so let's start with this. Let's say we're starting with a point on the plane. It could be any given point on the plane. And then pick another arbitrary point on the plane. Doesn't matter which one. Then the displacement vector here between the position vector of P and the position vector of P naught lies in the plane. And so it's parallel to the plane. Let me draw a little sketch real quick here. So like here's 
we'll say this is the point P naught, and here's the point P. The displacement vector that goes from P naught to P is given by this, and it's gonna be in the plane. So it's literally in the plane. Now, let's say that we have a vector that is orthogonal to the plane. Well, if it's orthogonal to the plane, that means it's orthogonal to every vector in the plane. So in particular, it's orthogonal to that vector that we just sketched, that vector that's in the plane. There we go. Now, remember that if two vectors are orthogonal, that means their dot product is zero. So if these two vectors are indeed orthogonal to each other, the dot product must be zero. And so from that, we get the vector equation of a plane. So the vector of equation of a plane with a normal vector n that contains the vector r minus r naught is given by this equation. Or just doing some vector arithmetic, you can rewrite the equation as this, n dot r equals n dot r naught. And this uniquely describes the plane because again, this normal vector is normal to every vector or every line that's in the plane, right? And this describes an arbitrary line in the plane. You just need a point. And then you need some other arbitrary point on the plane. And then you need a, a vector that's orthogonal to the plane. And in order for this relationship to describe a plane, the dot product of those two vectors must be equal to zero. That's the idea. So just ponder this for a minute. And then we're going to get some more intuition in just a second here. Yes. OK. Now, here's the fun part. So this can feel a little bit weird at first. Um, this makes sense if you think about it and ponder it. And you're like, OK, well, yeah, I mean, an orthogonal vector would be perpendicular to all the vectors in the plane. Yeah, I get that. But how do I make intuitive sense of what I'm looking at? You know what I mean? So this is where the, um, the scalar equation of a plane is going to be more helpful, get a little more helpful for, helpful, helpful for intuition, in my opinion. So here we go. Let's break this down into the parametric equations. Um, I'm sorry. Let's break this down into the components of these vectors and then see what we get. So let's say our normal vector is a, b, c and r is x, y, z, and r naught is x naught, y naught, z naught. Then just substituting in these component expressions for our vector expression over here on the left, we get this, a, b, c dot x minus x naught, y minus y naught, z minus z naught equals zero. Perform the dot product operation and you get a times x minus x naught plus b times y minus y naught plus c times z minus z naught equals zero. And that, my friends, is the scalar equation of a plane with the vectors described as above. So quite literally, this. So what you need is you need a normal vector to the plane that has these components, these direction numbers, right? Remember, those are the direction numbers. And you need a point on the plane, x naught, y naught, z naught. And then this relationship completely describes the plane in terms of that point and those direction numbers. Cool stuff, huh? Um, multiply all that stuff out, combine like terms, and then what you get is what's called the standard equation of a plane, ax plus by plus z, cz plus d equals zero. And in this case, d is equal to this, um, the opposite of ax naught plus bx naught plus cx naught. There you go. So this is one where I want you to, again, kind of ponder it, look at it for a minute. Right? And now say something out loud. Talk to yourself for a minute or talk to your friend, talk to your peers, talk to the wall, and just kind of talk about what you're looking at. Right. Now... Now, let's build up our intuition a little bit more. Um, yeah, uh, so yeah, let me just go to the next slide here. Uh, notice that both of these forms, the forms that I have boxed up here, they are natural generalizations of the point-slope form and standard form of a line in R2. So this is actually one of the reasons why I emphasize the point-slope form 
when I teach Calc 1, actually, when I teach pre-calculus and Calc 1 and Calc 2, I always try to encourage my students to move, move a little bit away from y equals mx plus b and move more toward, this way, move more toward point slope form. Because a lot of our analysis is isolated, or I shouldn't say isolated, a lot of our analysis is localized at a point. And so what's really happening here is we have a point and we have a direction. And that idea completely determines a line or a plane or in general, a, a, a hyperplane, which I think I talk about later. I just don't remember where. Um, so here I actually have, I'm just showing you that it really is similar. So here is the point slope form of a line in the plane. Remember this from back in the day? Y, not, y minus Y naught equals M times X minus X naught. Well, if you move this term to the right, uh, to the left side, you get this form. And this is basically the same thing that you see up here, except if this piece wasn't here. <laughs> if that piece wasn't there, then suddenly you actually have the equation of a line which makes a lot of sense if you think about a natural generalization to a higher dimensional, quote, line, right? You just need another direction number and you need another point. You need another dimension, right? That's exactly what this gives. That's exactly what that gives. Uh, standard form of a line. So again, uh, if you take either y equals mx plus b or you take the point slope form, you multiply everything out, move everything to one side, you get this. Remember that from back in the day? That's what you get. That's what you get. Standard form of a line. Now I have this little thing down here. What do you get when you set z equal to zero? So take a look at this, uh, this equation up here and set z equal to zero. And what you get is, what you get is ax plus by plus d equals zero, which is this. It's the same thing. So if you, you know, if you don't have a third dimension, then you just end up with the equation of a line again. So it's pretty cool. It's very natural. It's a very natural extension of the concept of a line to higher dimensional space, right? Okay, next. Uh, yes, a little bit of Mathematica. So we're gonna plot this plane using the following Mathematica command and then we're going to use it to deduce how to find the x, y, and z intercepts of a plane. So one of the cool things about this is there's so much intuition involved with it. Remember when you had um, when you had like the standard form of a line and you had to find the intercepts? You would use uh, a lot of my students would call it the cover-up method, right? You basically set <laughs> you basically set the different values, the different variables equal to zero, and then solve for the other variable and then you get the intercepts, right? So for example, here you would set y equal to zero and you'd be able to solve for x to get the, the, um, the x-intercept, right? And then you could set x equal to zero and then solve for the y-intercept. Well, we're gonna see that this kind of works the same way. Um, let me see real quick. Yeah, okay. Uh, oops, forgot to put a pause in that one. Um, let me open up Mathematica and let's take a look at it for just a second here. Again, you could also use Desmos's 3D, 3D graphing calculator. Um, but as you're going to see, we're going to use Mathematica for a lot more. So it's good to get comfortable with it now. Um, here I have a bunch of options that I just like to use to make things pretty. Um, oh, hang on a sec. Hang on a sec. Oh, sorry. Hold on one second. Let me, um, you can't see my mouse or you can give me a second. Let me troubleshoot a tech issue here. There we go. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Now you can see my mouse. So, um, yeah, these are just some options that I like to set to make, uh, the graphs look a little bit prettier. We can talk more about this during the activities when you get to mess around with these things. Um, but we're going to do this piece right here. So instead of using the exact code that I listed on the slides, which you're welcome to use on your own as you're watching the lecture. Um, I just wanted to put the, the command here. So this is the plane. We're using the command, uh, the command contour plot 3D. And this is the equation of the plane, x plus y plus z equals one to get this little, um, 
uh, Mathematica distinguishes between equals, 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 and equals, equals, equals. They mean different things. This is basically um, saying that this is equal to this mathematically. If you use a single equal sign, it's more of a, a variable assignment. So here, we're specifically saying that this is the plane that we saw from the, the example a minute ago. Um, these are the restrictions that we're putting on the different variables. So x goes between negative 5 and 5. Y goes between negative 5 and 5. Z goes between negative 5 and 5. And now I'm going to hit Shift Return. And it produces the plane. There we go. All right. So this is the plane described by x plus y plus z equals 1. And we're going to get to play around with this a lot. So in the activity, you're going to be graphing a bunch of different planes. And then in the next section, you're going to be graphing different quadric surfaces like cylinders and ellipsoids and uh, elliptical paraboloids and elliptic paraboloids and all sorts of stuff. Um, but this is really what, what we're doing here. It might look a little weird. You might be wondering why it's getting cut off. That's because there's a, there's a bounding box that I've hidden. So if you look here, one of the options that I set for this command is to hide the box. So if I were to eliminate this, let me comment out this line by hitting, uh, I guess for you all, or if you're using a Mac, it would be command backslash. I think it's a, maybe it's a forward slash. And then I'll recompile this. And then if I recompile it, oops, uh, contour plot 3D. Yeah, yeah, wait. Now let me try this again. Wait, why is it? Wait, boxed false. Shouldn't be, it should be. Hold on a second. Let me uncomment this. Uh, recompile, recompile. Let me try. Hmm. Should, that's kind of weird. It should. Yeah, I mean, it's there, there's a whole list of rules, press output. Hmm, that's a little strange. It should show the box. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. You know what? Um, maybe it's, it's calling this too. So hold on a sec. Uh, maybe it's, it's weird though. It's not the same. Okay, do that. Yeah, something's weird about that. Yeah, because that shouldn't matter. It's not for the same command. Um, well, okay. <laughs> Maybe I'll just add the condition boxed true. There we go. That's better. So now you can actually see the bounding box, and now it makes a little more sense why it looks cut off. So it's not that the plane ends right here. Remember, it's it's an infinite plane, so it goes on forever just like an infinite line. But at some point, you got to cut it off so you can look at a picture of it, right? And that's what the, the computer is doing here. Mathematica is cutting it off at that bounding box. But that's what it looks like. And what I want to do real quick is zoom in a little bit. So I'm going to change these constraints to be a little bit smaller. Oh, you know what? I didn't clear this. That's why it wasn't working. I didn't clear, I didn't clear these options first before I tried to recompile. Um, there we go. Okay, so I changed the constraints to be negative two to two, and I just want to do that to show you where the intercepts are. So if you look closely at this, let me make this a little bit bigger and zoom in a little more for you to see. Let's make this like two hundred percent. There we go. Okay, so what I'm looking at here is. If you look at where the plane intersects the coordinate axes, here it intersects the z-axis right up here at the point z equals 1, right? And then down here it intersects at uh, the x-axis at x equals 1. And here it intersects the y-axis. This is actually backward. You see how this is a negative 2, negative, negative 1? So really I should be ah, turning it this way. <laughs> there we go. This is what the plane looks like. I don't know if that makes it easier to see or harder, um, but it intersects the y-axis also at this point, y equals one. Ah, it's too hard to see. 
there there we go y equals one can kind of see it right there so what's happening is remember that you intercept those axes when the other two coordinates are zero that's what's happening here so if you look back at the equation of the plane if i set for example x and y equal to zero i get z equals one if i set y and z equal to zero i get x equals one and if I set x and z equal to zero, I get y equals one. And that's how you get those intercepts. It's basically the cover-up method, but now it's in three dimensions instead of two. So you just repeat that process and you can find all of the uh, the, axi, the axis intercepts. That's the idea there. Pretty cool stuff, huh? All right, let me go back to the slides. There we go. There we go. Ah. Okay, and for a minute, just pretend you can't see uh, you can't see this part, just for a second here. <laughs> pretend you can't see. I forgot to put a pause in the slides. All right, it's invisible now. There you go. Um, so this question asks you to find the equation or find an equation of the plane that passes through these three points, P, Q, and R. And that's it. So this is one that I want you to try on your own. So think about how you would do it first. How do you find the equation of that plane? Hmm. Okay, say something out loud. I would find the equation of that plane by... Right, and now try to work it out. See if you can compute what you need to compute and then write an equation of the plane. It can be the scalar equation or the vector equation. I think I might have both. I think I do both. Yeah, I do both, I believe. All right, now let's do it together. Um, so remember, if you want to describe a plane, all you need is a point in the plane, and you need a vector orthogonal to that plane. You need a normal vector. That's what we call the normal vector. So if I need a vector that is orthogonal to a plane, wink, 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 maybe I could use the cross product. Because remember, the cross product gives us a vector orthogonal to two other vectors. So we're going to do something that we did already when we were in the cross product section. We're going to take these points pairwise. What I do? P, yeah. Take these points pairwise, find two vectors, and then do the cross product to find a vector orthogonal to those two vectors. But if it's orthogonal to those two vectors, it's orthogonal to the plane, and then we're pretty much done. So let me go ahead and erase this now. So we have our choice of point. Um, we just need the two vectors. So I did PQ, which gives us this. You can do that calculation on your own. Just find the displacement vector here, right? Three minus one, and yada, yada, yada. And then I did PR. So these are our two vectors. Now I'm going to take the cross product of those two vectors to get a vector orthogonal to both of them. So I use my determinant notation. Uh, I didn't show that calculation here, but you're welcome to work that out on your own. And then this is, th this is a normal vector to the plane. So now we have our choice of point. You can choose whatever point you want. And we have our normal vector. And from that, we get the equations of our plane. Here we go. Um, yeah, I used P. Oh, no, sorry, I used Q in this case. So let's use Q. Uh, here's the normal vector. So those are our direction numbers. And then here's the point Q. So those are our point coordinates. And that's it. That's the scalar equation. We're done. That's the equation of the plane. Voila. All right, what's a vector equation? Same kind of thing. You basically just write this as a dot product. That's what's so nice about this stuff. Write it as a dot product. Um, oh, wait. That's not an equation. I'm missing part. There's a typo here. Uh, hold on. This should say equals zero. There you go. My bad. I'll fix that after this. Um, yeah, you just re, you know, interpret this as the dot product, right? It's this thing dotted with this thing. And that's what you get, right? So it's like this this there you go and it's equal to zero and that, that's the, the vector equation cool stuff all right um okay so 
how do you define two parallel planes? So two planes are parallel if their normal vectors are parallel. Uh, yeah, normal vectors are parallel. And that makes sense, right? So if you think about, like, if you put your two hands together, or not together, put your two hands like this, well, these two, vect uh, these two planes are parallel precisely because the normal vectors are parallel. So here's a normal vector to this plane. Here's a normal vector to this plane that the normal vector is parallel or the normal vectors are parallel. Therefore, the planes are parallel. That's the idea. Um, this is just a quick example uh, right here. So these two planes are parallel because their normal vectors are parallel. Look, the normal vector for this is 2, negative 1, 3. The normal vector for this is 4, negative 2, 6. And because this is a scalar multiple of this, that means those two vectors are parallel, which then means the two planes are parallel. So n2 equals 2 times n1. 2 times 2 is 4. 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. 2 times 3 is 6. So they're parallel. <clears throat> right. Now, if your planes are not parallel, <clears throat> then you can talk about the angle between the two planes. So this is where things get fun. Like imagine, you know, any, any two planes, like here's a plane with my hand. There we go. Here's another plane. <laughs> and if the planes are not parallel, that means that you can talk about an angle between them. There's an angle between the two planes. Also, if they're not parallel, they must intersect. They must intersect somewhere. And the intersection is going to be a line, right? So in this case, we want to be able to talk about the angle between them and, oh, obviously if the angle between them is zero, they're gonna be parallel. So how do you describe the angle between two planes? You do it kind of the same way that we did when we talked about the angle between two vectors. And really we're looking at the angle between the two normal vectors of the plane. So if you wanna know the angle between two planes, it's defined as the angle between the two normal vectors that you're dealing with. That's what it is, it's the acute angle between the two normal vectors. That's it. Um, yeah, so let's check out an example here. And this is one, again, that I want you to kind of try on your own. Some of these might take a little bit of pondering to figure out, but we've got lots of tools now. So what I want you to do is try to find the angle between these two planes, and then find equations, symmetric equations, for the line of intersection of these two planes. So here's a picture of the two planes. They intersect at a line. So what I want you to do is first find the angle between the two planes, then find the symmetric equations for this line of intersection. So it's two parts. So start by just pondering this for a bit. Think about it. Think about how you could find the angle Right? Then think about how you can find, it's a line, so how would you find the, the line of intersection? Right? Now, say something out loud to yourself about how you would start. What's the first thing you're going to try? Right. Now, break out the pencil, break out the pen, uh, try to find it, compute it, do some calculations, and we'll do it together in a second. All right, here we go. So the first part of the question isn't so bad. Um, find the angle between the two planes. Well, if we want to find the angle between the two planes, we just need to find the angle between the two normal vectors. That's not so hard. The normal vector here is, oops, is 1, 1, 1. The normal vector here is 1, negative 2, 3. So now if we want to find the angle between those two vectors, we can just use that dot product formula, right? Cosine of theta is the dot product divided by the length of the two vectors, the, divided by the product of the lengths, I should say. So same thing I wrote on the previous slide. Those are the two normal vectors. We just need to compute the length of each one. Uh, I'll leave you to do that calculation, but the dot product you get up here is this. And then the lengths multiply to be square root of 42. 
now you can compute the arc cosine of this and that's your angle. So the angle is arc cosine of two over root 42, which is about 72 degrees. Right. Now we found the angle between them, but now to find an equation for the line of intersection, we got to do a little bit more work. This is a little bit, a little bit harder, but once it kind of makes sense of it, it falls out nicely. So if we want to find the equation of that line, we, we need a point on the line and we need a direction, right? <laughs> so we need a point and a direction, a direction vector. So first let's just set arbitrarily Z equal to zero and we'll find where the, where the line intersects the X, Y plane. So this is basically helping us find a point on the line. How do you find a point on the line? Well, let's just find where the point intersects one of the coordinate planes. That's a good way to start. So set z equal to zero, and then, uh, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Where did I come from? Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. So if you set z equal to zero, then what you get is you get two equations in two variables then you can solve those that system of equations for x and y and that will give you the the x and y coordinates of the the point of intersection so that's what i'm doing here solve this system of equations you get x equals 1 and y equals 0 so this is a point on the line it's a point on the line so we're almost there now that we've got a point the next thing we need is a direction vector so we need a vector that's going to tell us where the line is going right? Well, in order to find a line, or sorry, a direction vector, well, how do I say this? Let me look back at the picture. Let's look back at the picture for a minute. Okay, consider this for just a minute. This line right here, oops, right? This line is in both of those planes, meaning it's contained in each one of those planes. So if this line is contained in each one of those planes, that means that it has to be orthogonal to the normal vectors of both of those planes, right? Think about that for a minute. That line is inside of both of the planes. That means it's got to be orthogonal to this vector, and it's got to be orthogonal to this vector too. So in other words, whatever this line is, it's orthogonal to both of those vectors. Does that sound like a familiar situation? Hmm a vector that is orthogonal to two other vectors. Hopefully you're thinking cross product because that's exactly what we're going to use. We're going to use the cross product. So we're going to look at the cross product of those two normal vectors to the plane. And then that will give us a vector that is parallel to our line. So our line is moving in this direction. That's all we needed to know. This is the, those, those are the direction numbers of the line. So now we've got a point, we've got a direction vector, and we can write our equations. There it is. Wild stuff, huh? <laughs> um, this again is one of those times where uh, the thing about Calculus 3, one of the harder parts is it does take a lot of three-dimensional visualization and it takes a lot of uh, building up your intuition for three-dimensional space and trying to think about the way that things look in three dimensions. So using Mathematica to help you visualize practicing sketching these objects, all of those are going to help you a lot in this course. All right, moving on. So we talked about lines, we talked about planes. Now let's talk about distances. So some distances in space. Oftentimes we want to know how far away one thing is from another in space. Even just if you think about physics applications, right? So let's try to find a formula for a distance from a point to a plane. So imagine you've got a plane in space, you've got a point in space, and what we want to know is we just want to know how far away the point is from that plane. That's the goal, right? That's the goal. So we need to find that distance. Here's how we're going to set it up. Let's let a P naught be any point on the plane. It could be like any point you want. There's a point right there. Um, we're going to let this vector be, or I'm sorry, and let P1 be a point not on the plane just like in the picture. P naught is on the plane, P1 is off of the plane, right? So what is this position vector? I'm sorry, what is this vector here? This is just the displacement vector from P naught to P1, which is this. 
There we go. Did I label it? Yeah, I did label it right here. Yes, okay. Yeah, there it is, there it is. Okay, so now we have this right here. And now if you look at the figure, what we really wanna know is we wanna know this distance. We wanna know that distance D. So that's the distance, um, oh wait, uh, from P, that is a typo, that is a typo. So this should say P1, there we go. The distance from P1 to the plane is the length of the scalar projection of B onto the normal vector. That's really all it is. So we're gonna project B down to the normal vector and that will give, and then we're gonna look at the length of that vector and that will give us the distance that we need. So here we go. If you remember from, what section was it? Uh, the, the dot products of two twelve point three, we had a formula for that. And if you wanted to find the scalar projection, you basically needed a unit vector in the direction of, in our case, the normal vector, and you needed to dot it with B. So that's what we've got here. Now, because we only want the, the length, actually, yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, wait, uh, yeah, yeah, we just want the distance. So we want the, uh, the, uh, the positive number, the positive number. Um, so we're gonna take the absolute value, just do some dot product arithmetic. That's a property of the dot product. Then we're gonna convert everything into the scalars. So n dot b is equal to this. And then down here we have the length of n using the formula for length of a vector. Then we're gonna simplify some stuff. So if you multiply this stuff out and then you kind of combine like terms, isolate all of the x1, I'm sorry, isolate all of the, the p1 terms and the p0 terms, you get this. But here's the cool thing. Take a look at this right here. Take a look at this right here. So x0, y0, z0, those are the coordinates of that point p0. But the coordinates of that point p0 satisfy the equation of the plane, because p0 is in the plane. That point is in the plane. So if that point is in the plane, that means that this must be true. So in particular, we know that a x naught plus b x naught plus c, I'm oh, sorry, it should be y naught, c z naught plus d equals zero. So if we move d to the other side here, we get that. Now let's substitute that into our formula right here. So this just becomes negative d. All right, negative times a negative is a positive. So in the end, we get our formula. And that's the formula for the distance from a point to a plane. There it is. Cool stuff. All right, <laughs> so it's already a lot, but now is a good time to talk about some helpful Mathematica commands. <laughs> um, Mathematica has a ton of visualization capabilities that we're gonna use in activity, uh, in this activity, the next activity, the next activity after that, and more activities. So um, I'll try to temper it a little bit now. One helpful command that Mathematica offers is simply the command vector angle. So that just gives you the angle between two vectors, which is kind of nice. Um, there's also this command, region distance. So region distance quite literally gives you the distance from a region to a point. So in our case, the region is a plane. Mathematica can do even more. It can give you the distance from an, an arbitrary region to a point. So if you have like a sphere in space and you have a point that's off the sphere or on the sphere even, Mathematica can tell you the distance, the shortest distance from that, that, that region to that point. Um, one little caveat is that in order to use this function, which I'll show you in a minute here, uh, you have to define the region in a way that Mathematica understands. So you can use this command, implicit region, or the command region. We're gonna use this one in just a moment here. So math, again, Mathematica can do this for us if we, if we really needed to do it quickly. So here's an example. Let's find the distance from the plane given by this equation to the point one, two, three. And then let's use Mathematica to, uh, to verify our result. So we're gonna do this by hand first, then we're gonna use Mathematica and be sure that we're right. 
So you try this one. Um, uh, this one, think about how you would start. How would you find this distance? All right, now try to work it out on your own. Hopefully you, you already said out loud to yourself what you're gonna try using that, that formula, right? All right, now let's work it out together. So we have the normal vector for the plane that's in here. We have the point. So really we're just kind of plugging and playing here. Plug those numbers in and work them out. So here's the normal vector. Uh, here's the length of that vector, just through some basic, uh, basic arithmetic, right? Plug everything into the formula and you get this. Uh, one little thing I'll point out is this, because this can, this can throw things off a bit. Um, here, D is actually equal to negative one. There we go. So remember the standard form is AX plus BY plus CZ plus D equals zero. So in our case, D is actually equal to negative one because it's on the other side, right? There we go. So this is what um, we computed by hand. Let's verify it using Mathematica. So here is the command that you can use, and then I'll pull it up on Mathematica in a second here. We're going to use region distance. And I'm using the command implicit region just so that we can describe it implicitly, like in terms of x, y, and, and z in this case. So this just says here is the, 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 this is the equation that describes the surface. Here are the variables involved. And then this little piece, that is the actual point. So that is the point. Let's go to Mathematica. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. I think I've got that one right here. Oh yeah, vector angle. So um, one thing I did was uh, the vector angle. Let, let's do this one first. In fact, let me go back on the slides to, what was that angle we computed just a moment ago? Where is it? Where is it? This one. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so real quick, before we do that, um, remember there was this question where we found the, uh, the angle between these two vectors using this formula. And so then we got arc cosine of two over root 42, which is about 72 degrees. Let's do, that. Let's do that in Mathematica. It's very quick. All right, so vector angle, I inputted the two vectors, shift return, and there it is. <laughs> That's what we found. Uh, the, the form is a little bit different. The form is a little bit different here because uh, they, they wrote it as a single square root. I think ours was two over square root of 42, which is equivalent, but it does actually compute it for you. If you want to get it in terms of degrees, or if you wanted, um, uh, for, for example, if you wanted a, what is it? If you wanted a, like a decimal approximation of this, you can use n. That'll give you the, the numerical approximation of a result. You can also specify how many decimal places you want. Um, I'm going to use the percent symbol, which basically means the last, uh, the last output that Mathematica produced. So it should call this output right here. And then, you know what, I'll do 50 decimal places, why not? There you go. So this number is about 1.25706, yada, 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 radians. And this result is in radians, by the way. It's in radians. You can convert it to degrees. Um, you just use degree, and it'll convert it to degrees. There you go. All right, so now let's go back to our distance question. Yeah, there we go. Let's go back to the distance question. And here's the command. I want to know the distance from a point to a region. The region that I'm describing is this plane. And this is, I'm sorry, these are the variables involved. And then this is the point, the point where I want to find the distance from. So shift return, five over three root three. That's exactly what we got. Check it out. Uh, oops. There we go. <laughs> 5 over 3 root 3. So Mathematica confirms this. 5 over 3 root 3. Cool stuff, huh? Helpful technology. <laughs> All right, so I think that's about it. Yep, on that note, let's play. 
Oof, oh my gosh, I know it's a lot of stuff. So I thank you for for bearing with the long lecture. Some of these just are just long. There's just so much content in a single section that it takes this much time to go through it. Um, we will get to play with these commands and visualize all sorts of cool things in the activity. So I'm excited to do that with you, but I will end things here and I will see you next time. Thanks a bunch. Thank you.